Thank you for visiting Pastor Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWire.com. You have to run to stay in front. Welcome to another episode of Unfiltered, only on Pastor Wire TV. Wilson and I are back on Pastor Wire TV for another episode of Unfiltered. Uh, Well-timed episode, in my opinion. The sales at Saratoga are underway. Uh, it's almost as exciting as the races, is it not, Mr. Wilson? Yeah, no, Saratoga sales are actually, they're quite fun. Um, it's a boutique sale, so everybody shows up uh, with some nice horses, with some nice pedigree. So this year's particularly interesting. Last year, I think there was a lot more pedigree than there were in terms of physical specimens like athletes. Um, I think last year we had 12 horses on the short list. This year we had about 35. So it's a solid sale for sure. No, 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 no doubt about it. And we're going to talk about four things uh, today and, and, and see where that goes. But we're not only going to do that, we're going to take people behind the scenes at the sale. Um, we're going to show them the process. We're going to talk a little bit about your selection process. We're going to talk about some sires to look for, maybe some sires to av uh, avoid. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the RNA process and what that means and whether... Um, it can even be advantageous for a horse not to sell and then you buy, 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 buy it privately afterward. Uh, we're going to talk about all of that. We're going to go re really behind the scenes. We've got some great footage from the sales. Uh, I think it's going to be a really exciting show. I'm anxious to talk about it. Uh, you, you know, before we show the atmosphere and we'll show, show, show the atmosphere um, and, you know, you're there, you're, you know, you're there working, you're there spectating, you know, you're there prospecting for horses. But what is it about the Saratoga sale and the atmosphere at Saratoga and then, you, you know, the whole environment that causes people that are sometimes very savvy business people to overpay possibly for, for a horse? It's an interesting sale. So Crazy Tipton is very smart with how they do it. They try and create a boutique sale with some horse with some great pedigrees and enough that people are going to want to buy them and probably pay a premium for them. Obviously, with everybody coming up for the races in Saratoga with the graded stakes on, everybody gets excited. So as you start watching these graded stakes, your dreams start running. Hey, maybe that could be me. And then bang, you have a sale. And so usually they, they do it well enough to where people are in an environment where they're excited. And then all of a sudden, now you've got these nice yearlings in front of you with some great pedigree and there's a lot of competition. So since it's in Saratoga, it's a destination to travel to. So you have a lot of big owners at this sale that right. might not be in attendance personally at future sales throughout the year. So sometimes you'll be inspecting horses as an agent or a racing manager and you'll look at a horse and say it's worth 300,000, okay? Then you come to Saratoga and look at that same horse. And you're like, this horse could be four to 500,000. Just because when you get people in a room and you might advise your client on 300,000, but if they fall in love with the horse and they want to leave the sale with the horse, sometimes they'll continue to bid until they get that horse. So sometimes that fuels bigger sales prices at a sale like this. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm going to relate it to cars, okay? Because I don't buy a lot of expensive horses, but... I don't know many people that buy as many expensive cars as I do and have over the course of my life. Okay. Um, used to go, go for one or two a year. Don't do that anymore. Uh, but I, I did buy several and I've got, I got really good at it. Uh, an example I'll throw out is about a, a year, year and a half ago, um, before we hit the pandemic related car shortage, a friend of mine wanted to buy a brand new Corvette and they had just changed the body style. OK, and you couldn't go to a dealer and buy one. They were all on order. Uh, most of them were sold before they got really to, to, you know, to the dealerships uh, and you had to go on a waiting list. And because of that, they would charge anywhere from five to 10 to 15, even 20, 25 thousand dollars over the sticker price. 
So my friend really wanted one, had to have one, wanted to be one of the first to have one. And he's like, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to buy one. Uh, you know, I'm going to put it in order. I'm going to, I found a guy who's going to sell me 10,000 over, over sticker. I said, don't do it. Don't, just, just don't do it. It's a bad move. You know, cars, you know, other than a Rolls and a couple of others, they're old and, you know, certain Ferraris, they, they all depreciate and they depreciate fast. And it's just a bad way to buy a car. And he had his heart set on it. I, talked him out of it and I told him exactly what would happen and it happened okay he bought it a year after they came out and instead of paying 10,000 over sticker he waited a little bit got the same car same year and he got it for 12,000 under sticker okay right. um it's a $22,000 swing okay yeah. on, 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 on a hundred thousand dollar car so that's right. you, you know that's considerable you know yes. Uh, and that's depreciation that over the course of a year, it, it's not as bad. You know what I mean? It's not as, as a bad of an, an, an investment. Uh, let's relate that to horses. If I want to come in to the game and I want to buy a horse and my budget is 200 grand and I want to buy two horses, 200 apiece. Okay. I want right. to spend 400,000. Am I I'm better off going to Saratoga and getting caught up in that mystique? Or am I better off waiting for Keeneland or waiting for another sale? and playing it smart and getting more bang for my buck. And the question is really twofold because one, am I smarter waiting? Or, and two is, where do I have a chance to get a better horse? I mean, the Corvette's the same, whether you buy it now or you buy it a year later. Are my chances of getting a good horse gonna be the same or vary from sale to sale? Yeah, phenomenal question. Uh, Saratoga, for 200 grand, you won't get anything. Um, you'll get a bad horse. That's really what you'll get. So when you look at sales, you have to look at it this way. If you have a certain budget that you're sticking to, Saratoga is not a sale that you necessarily want to buy out of unless your budget's four million, two million. You know, if you're gonna right. buy 10 to 12 yearlings throughout the year and you want to buy good enough horses that you have stallion prospects, Saratoga is one that comes on your list. If you have a budget in between 200 to a million, Saratoga is a sale that I would avoid. Because okay. I think as you go forward and you get into book two of Keeneland, book three of Keeneland, book four of Keeneland, you can buy just as good of an athlete with maybe a little bit less exciting pedigree and you can buy that horse at a significantly lower price. And we talked about it in the other show, John, we've right. talked about it multiple times, most grade one horses, are between 150 to 300,000. So as we're seeing last night, we had four horses over a million. You have multiple horses over 500,000. And so what I tend not to knock Phasic, because I think Phasic put together a great sale this year. But if you look at the catalog cover of these catalogs, you see their horses that have come out of the sales. So for a sale where you have horses selling as high as they are in this sale, there's not a whole lot of great horses on the catalog for this sale. There's good ones, Flight Line's one of them. He was bought out of the sale several years back. Um, so you do get a good horse every now and again, but you have to think of percentages. So I would steer people with that type of budget more towards Keeneland, more towards book two, three, and four at Keeneland, where you can get a nice horse for a nice price. Here, and it's interesting, I've had people come to me before and say, well, you know, I'd like to buy an Uncle Mo, and that Uncle Mo went for 50000 Well, Well, a bad, a $50,000 Uncle Mo is a really bad horse, whereas a $50,000 flame away could be a very good horse. So right. you need to think of what your goal is at the end of the day. If you want, you know, the brand, right? If you want to have a, a, a Bugatti that has uh, two wheels on it and it's driving on its rims that uh, you paid 25,000 for, well, right. that's one thing versus if you want, you know, a very nice uh, Corvette that has four wheels, runs perfectly fine and is great, uh, you're paying less. So it's, it's what your goal is at the end of the day. So, I mean, even in this sale, and there's some horses that I think even here, and, and you do see it tend to happen. So the first evening, even though it was very strong last night, people, the second evening's even stronger. Okay. So people get out bid night one, and then they really want to leave the sale with something because a lot of people don't like to lose. So getting outbid sometimes can feel like losing. And then they'll hone in on the next horse and the next horse and the next horse, which also tends to drive up the bidding prices on these horses at the sale because there's only 200 plus in the sale versus Keeneland. You've got 
couple thousand to get through, there's plenty of more opportunities at bat where you can get a horse. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's so many fascinating aspects of it. So uh, it's safe to say, and we're going to, in a minute, take a look at the environment and the hype and the, and, and the buildup in, 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 at the sales. But before we do that, let's just, let's just touch base. Is, is, is it safe to say that these um, wealthy people that come to this sale, okay, uh, with, with, with some of them with unlimited, unlimited checkbooks, okay, very, very deep wells, can't even get to the bottom of some of them. Uh, they get caught up in the hype, uh, ego kicks in, uh, they want to outbid this guy, they want to outbid that guy, they want to get this horse, that's the one everybody wants, nobody's going to outbid me, they go home after that first night at the sale, um, those competitive spirits, you, you know, uh, don't only apply to athletes, they apply to, you know, business people with checkbooks too, you know, you get uh, just a different arena, same game, different arena. Uh, they go back with a vengeance on the second night is what you're telling me. And like, you, 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 you know, gonna I think it, it happens, it happens, it happens quite a bit. And so, yeah, it, it does happen a lot. Um, I do think though, and it's interesting because we had horses on our list that I thought were bought in a very good range for what they were. Um, we tend to, and we'll talk more about it, I think, later in the show about what we do to select horses. But Sheikh mm -hmm. Fahat from Guitar bought one of the horses that we had on the list last night, who I thought was one of the better colts in the sale, probably the best colt in the sale. Um, and I thought for 500000 that colt was well worth it. So he was bought by Sheikh Fahad to go to Joseph O'Brien in Ireland. Um, so it kind of, that also builds into it. It's a big international mix of people. So you're having people, not just the American market, you have a very international market at this sale. So it also drives up prices. And I think tonight, if there were $4 million horses last night I, on day two, there's still some very good horses in this book. I think you're going to see big prices as well. Is, is, is there an advantage, uh, in buying one night over another night? Like, like, Tonight, you said is, uh, you, you know, book two, but are you better off trying to find a, a, a better value in book one than book two? Are you more up against it tonight than you were last night? I think it, it can tend to work out that way. Yeah. So early in a sales book, you have to think of it like this. People walk in with what they want to spend in certain regards. And so sometimes people sit back early in a sale. We saw that last night. There were some very affordable affordable prices early for the horses that were going through the ring. And then all of a sudden it skyrocketed and every price was going a little bit crazy. So what we thought was one of the better fillies in the sale was a filly who was hip number 17. She was a practical joke filly. She was bought by West Point. Um, we liked her a lot. Practical jokes obviously had, uh, he hasn't fully taken off as a stallion. So there was a little bit of a discount. And I know you, you talk about him on, in, in, on one of our scenes. So don't go too much into that because we're going to, yeah. Yeah. So, so sometimes if you get in the ring early, you know, you can get in and get out and get something. The other nice thing is, which we're looking at maybe a couple when we go back tonight that were on our list that are an aid because the sellers got a little over ambitious with the reserve. And now those horses in some situations are just sitting there because everybody's waiting for what they had on their list for the second evening. So sometimes if you jump in early you can get horses while everybody else is waiting for a horse that they have later on the list because some people don't want to run out of their budget too early in the sale they want to make sure they still have enough for other horses on their list absolutely uh let's give everybody a little bit of a glimpse into the atmosphere of the sale we'll see some big names floating around we'll see some people floating around we'll get an idea of, of, of what it's like and show how that that hype and adrenaline builds up and then we'll come back and there's an, an awful lot more to talk about because this is a, a fascinating subject and probably one of the more fascinating and interesting sales in the business. So uh, hang on for a minute. We will be right back. We think you'll enjoy this uh, glimpse into the Saratoga Fasic Tipton sale. As you see, this sale, more than other sales, is a pretty big spectator sale. People come to see it and see what happens. Funny thing is people like to clap when a horse hits a million dollars or a big purchase price. I'm going to million 550 and a million 550. All done. Million 550. Million 550. All right. Thanks very much. A lot of times I've discussed this before. A million dollars doesn't mean it's any good. You know, it's just a big sales price. So, you know, it's 
it's it's kind of fun that you have people that really want to see this. Um, it's a cool environment to sell horses in and be a part of, but it's definitely more of a showmanship sale than kind of you'd see in a different environment. This sale's very boutique. And for a boutique sale, they try and put together some great physicals. And what I mean by physicals, I mean athletes, right? And they try and put a lot of pedigree with those athletes to bring big sales price. Obviously, everybody comes up to Saratoga in the summer. All the major owners are here. So they want to create an environment where guys are going to come and then spend money. So they make it like a party and they bring everybody out. So a lot of times you will see owners at this sale that you see at no other sale throughout the year. A lot of other sales is mainly those of us who are agents acting on behalf of owners, but here the owners actually show up, they want to be here. So it's it's a fun sale in that regard. But a lot of it is just kind of that boutique-ness. It's the selected yearling sale for a reason. Well, there you have it. I mean, it's easy for me watching, even from here, I'm getting excited in Florida, I want to go buy a horse, and I know it's probably not the best thing to do. So, so you can see how people get caught up. And if you're in the game, and, and into buying horses and going to the sales, you can see how this one just has a certain a certain feel to it. You know what I mean? You, you know, and I think that goes a long way towards something that I've always marveled over. And we discussed it on a previous show. You know, you take some of the, the wealthiest, the most savvy, you know, business people in the world, and they make horrible decisions at the sales. Okay, horrible decisions. And and you have somebody like me, who's not an expert, not a bloodstock agent, you know, no, nowhere near the knowledge that, that you have in, in this arena. And I can recognize it. And I can be like, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? And I guess, you know, with that kind of money, it, it maybe doesn't matter. But still, if you're competitive and you want to be good, you, you know, I'd want to show you that, hey, you bought that horse for two million, and I got this one for four hundred thousand. I'm going to beat you all day long, and I'm going to make it to, to to this race. And 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 you're not, you know. And you're going to spend twenty million over over two three years to to hit that grand slam, and I'm going to do it with two or three million. That's how I would be competitive, you know. You, you, you know, if, if I was in that game, and you don't really see that. You don't really see anybody, the big money guys. Never. I mean, they get lucky, of course. They hit the Grand Slam, of course, because with that kind of money, you swing the bat enough times, you're going to get a hit, right? Right. Just how it is. But I don't see any of them play really savvy. You, you know, can you talk a little bit about why that may be and why some of them go with bloodstock agents, okay? And I don't want to disparage anybody individually, but, but some of them have terrible records, you, 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 know, you, you know, they brag about that one great horse that they bought and there's a hundred flops. You yeah. know, and I, I understand racing is a game where we're all wrong more than we're right. All of us. Okay. Right. Um, you know, you're hitting 300, 250 in racing. You're a superstar. Right. Right. But some of them are terrible, in my opinion. Some of them just like, you know. I, I, will, I wouldn't let, let you go go for the coffee in the morning, let alone buy me a horse. You know, I mean, I, you know, so can you talk a little about why this element of, 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 of wealthy people get caught up with, 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 with the wrong people or just don't play the game savvy? I think part of it comes down to, and I, I don't necessarily want to blame the owners on this. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to potentially who you're being informed by, right? So in every other aspect of your business life, you might be the expert in your arena. So you know what people know and what they don't know. And you surround yourself with a phenomenal team. Um, our sport, as we all know, is very foreign to a lot of people. And even 10, 11, 12, 13 years in, it can still be very foreign to people because there's so many different aspects of the sport. So Putting the right team around you is key. This is a sport that's built a lot off relationships, right? People want to be with people that they can trust, they feel, are looking out for their best interests. And it's not a knock against bloodstock agents. I don't think a lot are necessarily looking to say, hey, I'm going to go and buy a bunch of horses and take advantage of you. Um, I think it comes down to the fact that they don't have, certain ones don't have the knowledge to go and buy racehorses. And what I mean by that is, 
you know, we're coming from it with a different angle. I, I trained, I was on the training side. I've been around 40 grade one winners. Uh, my wife is an equine veterinarian who's also been on the racetrack most of her life. So when you see the end product and you worked with the end product, it's very easy to rewind and understand what you need to look for when you're trying to buy a yearling. If you look at the resumes of a lot of bloodstock agents, the top guys, a lot of them have racetrack experience, right? They, they've been there. They know what it takes to get there. They do a good job. But if you look at the vast majority, a lot of these bloodstock agents started out in stallion nominations, or they started out as client services at a farm. And basically what they've done is as they got to know people and gain their trust by servicing them in the role that they were in, they then had a clientele base to go out and shop yearlings for. Most have done a lot of farm work. And so they've seen yearlings and the odd one pops up and turns into a graded stakes horse or a grade one winner, but they only have one or two potentially in their career to then go off of, then go to the sales and buy. And so a lot of this in this business, when you're dealing in vast amounts of money, people wanna work with people that they can trust and so when you've known somebody for five to 10 years who's serviced you in a role as a nominations person who's helped you with your matings for your mares, or you've uh, been in a client services role who's helped you in a farm capacity, you gain a lot of trust with that individual. Now, because the game's so foreign to you, you then hear their knowledge when it comes to breeding and the other aspects that they know. So you assume they have the knowledge to then go buy you a racehorse. It's very different. There are a lot of pieces in this extra piece, which is why a lot of these horses don't turn out, is some people don't know exactly what it takes to make a good race horse. And those are aspects of those of us as trainers. And it's interesting, you see it a little less nowadays. Before, you'd see agents find horses, put them in front of the trainer who is going to train them, get the feedback from the trainer, and then the trainer tells the owner, yeah, let's buy it or no, let's buy it or let's not buy it. Nowadays, you see a lot of times agents go to the sales and buy horses without the trainer even being there. And even if it's a situation where the trainer, they don't necessarily know what type of horse that trainer wants. So sometimes you get in this situation where uh, an agent bought a horse that might not be the right horse and then send it to a trainer where that horse doesn't fit that trainer's program and then the horse just doesn't do well. And then somebody like, Myself comes along, sees that horse in a claiming race, jumps in and says, hey, you spent 300,000 on this. Thank you. I took him for $40,000. Now we're going to go run him up the ladder because now we put the horse in the right environment. So there is a, that's part of the key when you vet people. So many people in this buying side of the business do not have a background in the final product, which is the racetrack. So that's, I don't want to blame the owners on this. I think it comes down to, you met somebody who's always been good to you. You've always trusted them. You always think they have your back and they're not going to fess up that they don't know what they don't know. Right. And, 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 you know, and really to become a bloodstock agent, correct me if I'm wrong. You just need a guy that wants to give you their checkbook. Pretty much. Yeah. You, you, you know, it's yeah. not like, uh, you, you know, you've got to have any, any real knowledge. If you can sell yourself and, you know, people buy into whatever you're talking somebody wants to give you some money, um, you can do it or, or you can be like a pinhook kind of guy and go out, buy a horse and then just look for people to, you know, sell shares or sell them to afterwards, which is how a lot of, a lot of these partnerships actually start with people that are actually willing to put up their own money. Although I think there are more that rather play with other people's money. You talk a little bit in our next segment about sires. Okay. Right. And I think that's crucial when you go to buy a horse. All right. Uh, I'll give you uh my my thought my philosophy and how i would play it uh and then you let me know if i'm on target if i'm off base and 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 how you play it and how it really really should be played i always thought it's an advantage um if you're buying a horse out of a sale to 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 gamble on your own opinion and your own gut instinct and look for unmade stallions, new stallions that you believe are going to be good and not necessarily the fashionable ones that everybody thinks are going to be good. Um, and sometimes you can, you can find horses that were quite accomplished on the racetrack, but yet people don't think of them as they're going to be phenomenal sires. Um, you know, one horse that comes to mind for me is M Matole, who was a brilliantly fast horse, but nobody's really excited about what kind of stallion he's going to be. 
I would look to breed to him. And I wouldn't strictly look to breed to him as a sprinter because, you know, he was, I think he was an Escondrea who was kind of meant to go along and got hurt, was a, you know, pre-derby favorite. Uh, and he just happened to wind up being a very fast horse that I think um, he did get a mile, I think has the chance to get horses that are fast and can carry it a little further out of the right female or, or mare line. Um, Good Magic is another horse that I think is going to turn out to be an excellent sire. Um, I was excited the other day, day when, when Chad ran that Mendelssohn filly on the grass um, that won very impressively. I think she's a really, really good filly. And I think Mendelssohn is going to be a fantastic sire and make, make, make a lot of noise. And I think those are horses that I mean, and I'm not going to say they don't have any hype now, but they're not super hype. They're not on everybody's list. And I think you know, they're, they're, they're stallions that their prices, if I'm right, are going to go up and up and they're going to be producers and it's going to be harder to get to them two or three years from now than it might be today. And if I had, you know, if I was at the sales buying all these babies and had a bunch of them, I got a shot to hit a, a, a grand slam. So my thought is, Look for stallions that you believe in, but that necessarily everybody else doesn't believe in yet or is not on the bandwagon. And, and I apply that same philosophy in, in wagering. It's always nice to find a horse that, you know, everybody's not on the bandwagon and you are. So can you talk a little bit about, A, is that a decent approach? What are the flaws in that approach? And what's your approach and your thought on sires and some of the ones you like and maybe some that you don't like and then we'll we'll go right into that next clip where you talk a little bit about about sires yeah as we go through these sales we see more and more of their offspring and you can kind of get a gauge on who's going to hit and who might not um stallion that i very much liked um, by seeing him as a physical, and I really like his babies, his Audible. I think Audible is going to do extremely well. Um, I think there's several Audibles in this sale that are out of mares that don't have a whole lot of page and pedigree in the first dam that can be bought for a price, but I think they're significant athletes. I have three on my list um, that I think are, are, are substantial horses at this sale. Now, that um, kind of goes with what I'm saying, because he's not one that everybody's talking about, oh, I can't wait to see the Audibles. No, no. And he's a horse where I think because of, you know, he won the Florida Derby and he fell off a little bit that he went to stud a little quiet. And so what tends to happen with these stallions is you need to retire them off of a, off of a big win, right? To keep that hype going through their career when they go to the breeding shed to keep people excited. Because once they're in the breeding shed, they tend to be forgotten about unless you're advertising them all the time and keeping that name in front of people. That's literally what it is, this brand building. Stallions are brand building. Keep that name in front of them keep it out there. I mean, Run Happy hasn't done a whole lot, but everybody knows who Run Happy is. Everybody. So, you know, I, if anybody I, connected with Run Happy is watching, I just want to say this because I think it's noteworthy. Pass the wire, unfilled. We are the only horse racing platform that Run Happy does not advertise on, I believe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. McInvale, hello. What's one more going to mean at this, at, this, at this stage of the game? Everybody says, what a great guy you are. You can advertise run happy with us too, but continue. Yeah. So I had to throw that in there because I do think we are the only one, but go ahead. Right. So um, the other who I, I always love as a racehorse, I think he retired without the hype he deserved. And I think he's fallen through the cracks as well as Omaha Beach. I think Omaha Beach is going to be an exceptional sire. Um, you know, a horse that he's throwing horses that look a little bit more like his sire, more like Warfront than like himself. Um, so I think they might go dirt and turf versus just Omaha beach. They tried on the grass early and he wasn't a grass horse. He was a dirt horse. Um, but I think they could go either way. Good magic. I agree with you on, we bred some to good magic. I like him. We bought a good magic last year out of this sale for a client. Um, Vina Rosa will be interesting. Uh, those horses look like they want to be later. You know, like they're going to be three years old. They're not going to come out. I mean, obviously, he didn't reach himself until he was four. Um, and those are what his babies are looking like. So I think this year would not be the year to buy him because there's still a little hype from him. I would wait until next year when the two-year-olds don't run uh, and then maybe buy him as yearlings at a discount because he's going to probably jump off when they're three. 
And that's where that's that I got to say, that's a really astute observation because that kind of goes towards what I was saying, but in the reverse order, yeah. you know, instead of looking for that value now, waiting to look for that value after. And it, it begs another question that I got to throw in before you continue, and then you just can just run with it. Uh, if you're looking for a, a distance slash classic type of horse or a horse that doesn't necessarily have to win as a two-year-old or first time out, that you're okay with giving to a trainer and say, hey, take your time, develop this horse. You know, if he's a good three or four-year-old, I'm fine with that. Maybe then you look at a Vino Rosa. I would agree. Uh, you're going to have to be patient with them. Um, they're big horses. Um, and they're horses that look like they, they want to be later maturing. They don't look like they're going to be precocious. Uh, Good Magic was probably the rare son of Curlin that looks like he throws horses that are going to be able to run a little bit at two. They're going to get better as they go on their two-year-old year and into their three-year-old year. Um, so he had a little bit more excitement around the yearling auction. Um, Matoli, his half-brother's in the sale, the half-brother to Matoli and Hot Rod Charlie. He sells tonight his hip 207, I believe. He's a uh, He's into mischief, I believe, half to Matoli and Hot Rod Charlie. Let me double check my catalog to make sure I'm giving you the correct hip number on this horse. Uh, yeah, 207 into mischief, half brother to Matoli and Hot Rod Charlie. So he actually looks a lot What's like he gonna him. go for? Oh, he'll be gangbusters. He's he's actually a, he's 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 quite a nice horse. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a two million dollar yearly. I was going to say, I'm buying for 700. Yeah. I'll give you 700 he, to buy. He's, it's we get him. He looks more like Matoli. He looks very much like Matoli. I'd love to see the dam at some stage to see what she looks like. Um, the Matolis are interesting. And, and I'm going to be honest, John, he's not my favorite sire. He's, okay, now listen, I, 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 you know, he, I don't have tends, your expertise. He tends to throw smaller. Uh, he doesn't put a whole lot of size into his horses. They were meant, they looked like they were going to be cheap speed. Um, that would come out early, bang, win a couple races and not really develop because he's not the biggest stallion. Um, I think they could get better. Obviously, stallions in this game, as you're saying, with not this time, he's a half-brother of Liam's map. A lot of times a stallion is based on pedigree. You know, you very rarely see stallions with no pedigree make it in the game. Mendelssohn, you touched on. Mendelssohn's horses last year as yearlings were not the types of horses that you'd get super excited about. You could see the potential in them, but they were going to be later maturing as well. They weren't going to be early. So I think, again, I think you're on the mark. I think if you can find a good Mendelssohn this year, it's a good buy because besides the one that Chad had, he hasn't made a whole lot of noise yet. I'm not saying he's not. I think he is because I think he's a phenomenal looking sire. And I think obviously with his brother and his sister being who they are, he right. will have the pedigree to take on and do well. Um, but those were horses that you looked at and said, they're gonna need time. And you know, you're know you gonna see them come out in the later part of the year, more than likely on the turf. He's probably one of the few stallions that is almost identical to his sire, Scat Daddy. He looks the most like Scat Daddy of any other stallion. So um, I do agree with you, now would be the time to buy Mendelssohn's and we're seeing it right we're seeing in the marketplace stallions who are not not this time who are not Uncle Mo who are not Curlin uh, or, or into mischief or Gunrunner and, and Gunrunner is an interesting one um, Gunrunner I love I think he's phenomenal I think he throws it an extremely athletic course every single time the Gunrunners we saw last year and the Gunrunners we saw the year before I think we're very good horses. We're now in year three. So these are going to be horses where he's gotten a little quiet. He came off the track, got a lot of good mares. Second year, you tend to get a little less quality mare. It happens to every stallion. Your first year, if you're a good stallion, you get a great book of mares. Second year, you decline a little bit. Third year, you decline even more. And then if you have enough good runners in your first crop, you know, when they're two and when they're three and your second crop comes out like he's done, you'll get the phenomenal mares as you keep going forward. So what I've seen at this sale from the gun runners, I don't see the same quality of yearling as I did see last year. You can see that he probably didn't have as good of book as he had in previous years. But if you find a good one, you're going to pay through the roof for him because he's, he's some as a sire. So 
those people who might get excited and say, oh, gun runner's the, the next best thing and he is the best thing, he is. But you do need to realize he's in year three of his book and it might be a year where he has some mares that weren't the same quality that he got when he retired off the track in year one and two. So you gotta be careful. We're, we're gonna go back to the sale now. We'll come back and talk some more, but we're gonna go back to the sale, see Michael um, at the sale, talk a little bit more about some sires um, that he likes, maybe doesn't like. And a good takeaway from this is if you like Gunrunner, you buy those first or any any top, top sire, you buy the first year yearlings, then you wait two years and you buy the fourth. So first go to fourth because that's when the good mares are cycling back around if he's really all that. That's my takeaway from that. We'll go back to the sales and we'll come back. That's kind of what you see in this sport. If you have somebody who's by a hot sire, you get a bigger price going through the ring than somebody who's by a cold sire. Doesn't mean that they can't un outrun their pedigree, but it does dictate a lot of price. But not this time has done well. He's had a couple horse on the Derby Trail this year. He's come up in the stallion ranks. So that one sells for 375, and one who's by a cold sire sells for 240. That's how the market plays. What you'll look at is when a stallion has his first crop, you'll want to see how they do as two-year-olds. Everybody predicted Practical Joke was a very good two-year-old, would throw horses that would want to be two-year-olds. They came out running early. They won races early, and none of them continued on at the end of their two-year-old career in the graded stake status or continued on into their three-year-old year being significant horses. Whereas some of these other horses, like Not This Time, came in, didn't have a whole lot of two-year-old winners. But now that we have the Derby and we had other things going on, he's turned into a much more substantial sire. It wasn't his first season like Practical Joke last year, but he stamped himself a little bit more along the line. So things fluctuate in our business. Every stallion can throw a big horse, but you're looking for consistency. How often do they have big horses? How often do they have horses that want to run off? Gunrunner, number one. Obviously, he's had with Cyberknife and all the grade one winners he had last year at two, and he's got Taiba as well this year. He's such a substantial stallion, and those horses are going to suffer massive premiums. The others would be Into Mischief. The others would be Not This Time. Um, and that's kind of Uncle Mo always is, I mean, he's stamped himself as a solid sire, so they're always going to be expensive horses. Curlins are always going to be expensive horses. But as the ones that are on the come up, you're going to see a lot more from not this time in Gunrunner this year than you did last year in terms of sales prices. Justifies popped up, which is interesting because you wouldn't have expected his horses to be early two-year-olds. And he's thrown a lot of two-year-old winners. He's got two-year-old stakes winners as well. So you're going to start seeing him come around as well. He's a triple crown winner. So in his first couple of yearling sales, he was hot, but now he's produced. So now people are going to continue to spend as they go on. You know, the, the next thing I want to talk about uh, and, 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 and pick your brain on a little bit is, is RNA and, and, and what it means. Uh, what does it stand for? Why the horses RNA? Uh, can you find a good deal on a horse that RNAs by buying him privately. Uh, when you inspect horses, and I want you to talk a little bit about you, you know, your inspection process, what you look for when you're looking at, 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 at these you know, horses in the sales, what might prompt you to say, you know what, that's a hard pass. Uh, or that's one that we want. So a little bit about your, you know, that you're willing to share anyway, that you, you know, I know it's competitive, you, you know, uh, and, 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 and another thing I want you to, to touch on a little bit, and it, it goes back to something you said earlier, you know, you said, oh, well, you see an Uncle Mo for 50, um, or any horse that you see selling for significantly less than the stud fee is, is that a red flag right off the bat? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, you, you know, because sometimes I'll see that in the racing form when I'm handicapping and they win. And, you know, it's not like I draw a line through it. I can't bet a horse like that. I mean, I do flag it and I go, hmm, must be a reason that this, you know, $50,000 stud fee sold for $20,000 uh, and is still in a main special weight race. But Talk, talk a little bit about all of that, starting with RNA, leading into, into the rest. And yeah, so that's that's a lot. So I'll try and figure out. So RNA stands for reserve, not attain. And what a reserve is, is what the seller sets as the price point that they want the horse to sell for. So they might look at their yearling 
Um, we have a filly that didn't sell yesterday that I love that I really want to look at today and see if maybe we could purchase her for somebody. Um, so sometimes they'll have an idea of what the mare looked like, what the filly looks like. And they say they might want to keep that horse uh, themselves, but they might say, you know what, I'm not selling it for less than 300,000. Okay. And so 300,000 is the bid that they need to receive over 300,000. If it's 301, they'll sell that horse. But if it's 300, that horse will not be sold. And so it comes down to what sometimes they make it based on the market. They think the market's going to be hot enough. They can sell for that price. Sometimes they don't want to sell the horse for less. Sometimes what you'll see though, and this is, it's not easy for sellers to then come back with a horse that was not sold for a certain amount of money and get more money for them down the line. So sometimes you can negotiate deals on these horses because when they bring them back, they're called retreads. They've been through one sale, they did not sell. Now they're in another sale and people are wondering, why did this horse not sell? And we saw it last year, there was a, uh, trying to remember, I think it was a Curlin Colt that we were looking at last year. Um, and the horse was a very nice horse, had a little fluid in his knees as a yearling. Really, really nice horse was RNA for a significant amount of money. I think it was like seven hundred and fifty thousand. The horse didn't sell for. So then he goes to another sale, and again, he doesn't sell. He doesn't sell for far less. I think he didn't sell for for four. So then he's in October, and I think he sold for two hundred twenty five thousand. So you got to be careful when you take these horses onwards. They could be substantial horses. A lot of these owner breeders are trying to sell them at the right time. They're trying to make sure that they're selling the horse at their peak. So if you have a horse that looks the part at Saratoga, you want to sell at Saratoga because as it hits a growth spurt going into the September sale, it could look completely like a different horse. Same thing when you go into October, it could have hit a, they all go as, as we humans do. We all hit our ugly teenage phase, right? These babies hit an ugly phase in their growth spurt, even if they're gorgeous horses. So they're trying to sell them at the right time. So when they do not sell, you can go back to the consignor and say, what was, what were you wanting? A lot of times we'll do that work before. We'll know what the reserve is where the horse goes through the ring. Is that public? Can you find that out? You know what it was? Yeah, I can ask the consignor. Okay. I can go up to him and say, what, what are your reserves on the horse that you're selling tonight? And they'll say that's, this that, one. That's, that's totally copacetic. That's not like Absolutely, yeah, okay. yeah. Because I need to know what they're wanting. And then I need to know if I'm willing to pay that. So for me, I might look at horses and we tend to get that information. Dominique does a great job gathering that information because if we look at a horse and we say, we like this horse, he's not good enough for list one, but he's good enough for list two. Our list two are horses we wanna try and buy for a deal. We don't wanna overspend on them. But if they've set the reserve so high, there's no point in us spending the money to bet that horse because we don't want to waste money on a horse we're not willing to pay that amount for. So let's say I have a horse that I think is worth 250 and their reserve is 400,000. I'm not going to bet the horse. Now if the horse doesn't sell for 400,000. Now I have time to go back to the consigner and negotiate and say, what do you want? And if they say, well, we'll go. And if I, sometimes you can just make an offer and say, I'm interested at 250 if the horse bets. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, no, we'll take 250. And then I can bet the horse, make sure he checks out. And if he checks out, we buy the horse for the price that we offered. So can you, can you check out a horse in greater detail and vet a horse in greater detail when you buy an RNA privately like that than you can at auction? We do the same amount of work, uh, pre-sale or post-sale. Um, but a lot of it for us is we're trying to save client money. So we're only going to bet horses that we 100% know with the reserve, what we feel the horse is valued at. We're only going to spend money to bet them then. So before all of these horses go through the ring, they'll set a price. An owner will pick a price on what they want the horse to sell for. If the horse does not sell for that price, what will happen is they don't sell. And so then you can go to the consigner and find out what type of price do they want for the horse and potentially negotiate to get a good offer on the horse to get the horse bought. It's something typically you try and have all your money up front to purchase these horses. We're going to head this way to the barn. But a lot of it comes down to when these horses don't get sold, sometimes they're willing to take any offer because they, they just want to sell the horse. 
Maybe they got a little over ambitious with what they thought price tag wise and they didn't get it. And now the horse is just sitting there while everybody else is waiting to spend money on horse that are going to go through the ring. So you can sometimes get these at a bargain price. So when you have RNAs, the biggest thing is, and it's, you don't know until you ask the consigner, unless you ask what the reserve was before you went to the sale to see the horse and what they were thinking before. So a lot of times you got to hustle because you got to get back to the barn and you got to check and you have to ask, what do they want for the horse? Because somebody else might come in with a quick offer on the horse and buy it before you get there. You just say, what are you, what are you offering? How does it look? Um, what do you want for the horse? And they're going to wait until they get the best offer for the horse. Hey, John, how you doing, bud? Fantastic. Did Hip 17 sell? Oh, you did sell her. Okay. I was curious. I saw that price and knew what she was like and was wondering if you RNA her or not. So, okay. Yeah. Well, that's the discount for the sire. We joked about that, huh? Well, it is, it is what it is. Well, who, 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 who bought her? West Point, okay. Well, I'm right behind you. Okay, all right, bye. Physically, you, you put her you put her any other stallion, she's a $500,000 filly. Or last year, she's a $700,000 horse. Exactly, yeah. exactly, so, yeah. So, hey, okay. there's a risk. Look, we, we bought two of them for 260, and we got, we got 170 for the first one, so we got 410 for the two of them. So okay. It's not like you can't still make money off horse. Exactly. Yeah. All right. The so I need to talk to, talk to Terry if I can partner in on her, huh? There you go. Yeah. Go talk to Terry. All right. Man. Sounds good. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. So that's kind of the process. You figure out, did the horse sell? It did sell. Sometimes you can approach the owner who bought the horse and say, hey, we have somebody who wants to buy a piece. Partner in as you're seeing a lot of these partnerships and conglomerates of owners. Sometimes, depending, if you bring in an owner for a big enough chunk of the horse, sometimes you can also dictate where that horse goes to be trained. So there's different pieces that you can do after the fact to try and get good horses and become a part of them. What we tend to do, and I'll take you through our selection process now because it's natural flow. So we go through the sale. We don't even necessarily look at who the stallion is and we don't necessarily look at who the mare is. We look at the horse standing in front of us. And what I want to look for is I want to look for efficiency of movement. And I think of a horse like you would a car or like you would any other athlete, right? You want the best ability to have power transfer from the hind end to the front end. So that horse goes in forward momentum. I've been lucky that I've learned from Wayne Lucas in terms of what Wayne Lucas looks for in a horse, what Bob Baffert looks at in a horse, what Donato Lani looks at who selects Bob's horses in a horse and Ken McPeak. And then who's one of the best guys in Europe selecting horses, Mark Johnston. So I've learned from a lot of the greats and I've compiled that information and in how I look at a horse. So for me, a lot of it comes down to uh, how they use themselves. There are some horses that I'll stand up and they're not the prettiest physical, but if they use themselves extremely efficiently, I know that they're not gonna waste action when they actually run or train. And I can look at it from a little bit different angle because I've trained horses. So I can look at it and say, well, this horse's neck set too high. His back is a little bit soft. Yes, he's gorgeous. He has a great shoulder angle. He has a great hip. He doesn't necessarily walk. His back is a little bit too weak, which is why he can't push off the hind end. Because he can't push off the hind end, he's not getting power transferred. But because his neck is high set, there's nothing I can do in the training environment to fix this horse. So to strengthen a soft back on a horse, you need to have the neck angle set perfectly to where you could put the horse and teach him to drop his head so he travels in the bridle. When he travels in the bridle, he uses his back and he uses his glute muscles fully and you can strengthen a weak back horse. If their neck's at an odd angle, you don't have that ability. So as I look at horses, I look at how they use themselves as an entire unit. The last piece, which is interesting because I see other agents who work opposite, Okay, you go to Kentucky, there's a lot of great grade one winners in the breeding shed that are crooked, okay? I don't worry as much about front leg limb conformity as long as they use themselves correctly. And what I mean by that is if I have a horse that toes in and is offset in his knee and he doesn't fully extend his leg to where I think it should go biomechanically and he lands heavy, 
It's a horse that I'm going to worry about in training of that conformation holding up. If he has full extension of his limb and he lands softly like a cat, I'm not worried because he's going to take care of himself in training. There's a lot of straight-legged horses that can't run worth a lick. And there's a lot of straight-legged horses that can't stay sound. So for me, I look top down. I'm looking at the engine, which is the shoulder, the back, and the hip. I'm looking at where that neck is placed. Wayne Lucas is very much talks about if you look at where a horse's angle of his head is when you stand in front of him and his shoulder angle, you want those two to be parallel, right? Because that'll lead to forward momentum. So I look at the engine and then I look at the chassis and I make sure the chassis is good enough to hold the power of the car to make sure everything goes forward. Some people start chassis engine. If you don't have the engine, it doesn't matter how straight the legs are. You need the engine first. So those are just pieces of how we inspect. Once we inspect, we have list one. List one is we will mortgage the house. We will sell all the cars. We will figure out what we have to do to get that horse bought out of that list. That's horses you need to leave the sales with if you can get them. List two are still good horses. And I don't put anything on the list that I don't think can't win a maiden special weight allowance and potentially become a stakes horse. Some people come up to me and say, hey, can you buy me a horse in between 60 and 80,000? I can if it makes list two or list one, okay? But I don't go to a sale and say, oh, there's a horse, he sold for 50, he's okay, because horses that don't make our list, I have a scoring system, which initially Lucas taught me, he had a one to 10 rating. It's funny over the years, my rating really falls in between five and a half and eight now with you know marginal decimal points. Um, wow. If it's a horse that's a six and a half, that doesn't make the list. Six and three quarters makes list two, sevens make list one, and everything above a seven is, is gravy. So when I have a horse that's a six and a half, if I have a six and a half, that's 50 grand, and it's by a decent sire, if the person, I'll tell them, six and a half are maiden claiming horses for me. They're not gonna be maiden special way horses. So don't expect that because we found a horse for 50 grand, it's gonna be any good. But if there's a horse that's a six and three quarter on list two, we still might get a good horse at a good price that's still a good athlete. So that's part of the process. And then based on how I assess these horses, if they're list one, as I say, you pay through the roof. If it's, if it's list two, I want those horses at a price that I think is fair for that horse. And we'll see Wayne is at the, uh, in, in some of our footage. He's there scoping them out and still doing it after, after, after all these years and having not a bad year this year. Um, yeah. He, he went the other day with that nice filly. And uh, of course he's got that big filly uh, secret oak that, that, that you like a lot. Um, so, you, you know, all fascinating stuff. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, is there a ugly side to the sale? And by that, I mean, yeah, ugly. There's a, oh, everything always comes down to three things, okay? Yeah. And it's old Sergio Leone Weston, which is a classic movie of all time. It's always one of the three, the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. Well, every, everything falls into that category, Those one of those categories. Is there an ugly side where... Um, consigners are bringing horses to Saratoga that are, you know, souped up on steroids or other things that make them look phenomenal. Uh, those biophosphonates and, 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 and different kinds of drugs. Are there, are there shady deals going on where, Hey, you, you know, wink, wink, you can drive up the price of this horse because I've got this guy on the hook that wants to buy it. Uh, and I can get a big fat commission. How much of that kind of ugly stuff goes on at Saratoga Fasic Tip, if at all? This sale... I don't need to put you on the spot, but it's unfiltered. So if it's going on... No, ab absolutely. So the ugly side, I thought you meant ugly sire. So I'm kind of like ugly sire. No, I mean, I'll, I'll someone that throw donkeys. Um, I, have a, I have an accent. Ugly, ugly side, I, yeah. I have an yeah. accent. I can't um, help. So... There are situations, I wouldn't necessarily say it's ugly. So if you looked at some of these million dollar horses and you look who bought them, okay? They are the stallion stations who stand those stallions, okay? So I'm not saying basically what they 
how the stallion business works is you want to keep stallion books full with the best types of mares that you can get at all times. So if you have the ability to promote that your stallion had a million dollar yearling, uh, or hey, look, Uncle Mo had two million dollar yearlings and Justify had a million dollar yearling, okay? It's another means to promote that stallion. So if you look at some of the tickets and who signed them and the price tags that they were on, it's not necessarily a, they drove up the price, it's they were bidding themselves. They might like the horse, they still might like to keep that horse by their sire, but they're supporting their stallion by showing that he can throw million dollar horses to try and keep his book full. So that is one thing to look at when you say, hey, look, why'd that Uncle Mo sell for a million? And you see who signed the ticket, MV Magner, it's Coolmore, right? Uncle Mo stands right. at Coolmore. So as you look at that, there are some of those things. Some of the stuff where you're talking about wink, wink, drive up the price. It sometimes depends on the consigner. I don't think it's as prevalent at Saratoga as it could be at other sales. Um, what I would say at Saratoga, and it's not necessarily an ugly side, it's just a non-informed side. So in years past, Saratoga has been a sale where it is massive pedigrees, okay? So you'll see, and I'm saying that the half brother to Hot Rod Charlie and Matoli is a very nice horse, okay? But you might have a horse that comes as a half brother to Hot Rod Charlie and Matoli and is not a very nice horse. But because of the pedigree, somebody is gonna well overspend on what that horse is worth because they see the page, they see what's standing in front of him. There's a lot of excitement at the sales. And next thing you know, they far overspent on what that horse should have been worth. So it's, I wouldn't say, we see it all the time. We'll say, you know what, this horse is gonna be a million dollar horse, but he's really only worth 200,000. It's not necessarily bidding up because the reserve is set. We knew what the reserve was. We knew the reserve was half a million. We said the horse isn't worth half a million. So we say, he's off our list. We're not interested. We walk away. But there are people that don't know those finite points. There are people that might have some agents who understand a horse might go for a big sales price and are going to buy it for the commission. Um, so there are sides of that where uh, I have heard, not a specific name, but there is an agent that goes around and knows which consigners have horses that are going to bring a lot of money, and he bids on those horses. Um, not always buying the best athlete, buying what's going to sell for the most. So there are certain things that sometimes play in like that, that per, you just have. I would, I would put that in the ugly, in the ugly category myself. So you just, you have to be careful of who you work with. It really comes down to making sure. And, and I need to implore owners, ask the tough questions to your guys. Okay. See yeah. how much they know, drill down and put them. If you have an agent who buys for you, put him in a room with your trainer, have him talk, see if, see if he can even hang with what your trainer knows, right? Because if you have a great trainer, the agent can't hang on the same level in terms of what that trainer understands and what that trainer knows. That agent shouldn't probably be buying horses for you. I'll take that a step further. If you've got a great trainer and he's looking out for you and he knows that you've got a guy that doesn't know what they're doing, buying horses, he should be telling you, listen, you need to get with so-and-so or so-and-so, you know, don't be bringing me this guy's horses anymore. Yeah. I, I think, you know, sometimes it's, it's a hard line when you are a trainer because you're afraid to upset a relationship and lose potential business by yeah. pointing out to an owner that he might be working with somebody he shouldn't be working with. Um, personally, I have a great group of clients and I, I've told them, thank you so much for letting me have the ball and, and run with it. Because as a trainer, when I pointed out, Hey, this situation might not be right for your horses or, Hey, you need to think about this with the guy that you're working with. I typically got fired. So it is a thing as trainers that they're very careful to not upset the egg, uh, basket because, it's typically the trainer's the first one on the chopping block that gets tossed out. We're going to um, close out now with, with, with what I think is probably the most interesting, interesting part of, uh, of this show that I thoroughly enjoy doing. Uh, 
there was, I think, a war front that you liked a lot, which yeah. uh, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to have you talking about that horse in a minute at the sale and, and, and what you liked about him. So what I'm going to ask you now, in addition to that war front, um, tell us about a couple of horses in the sale, be it, be it uh, you, you know, ones that already have gone through the ring or some that are coming up that you like. And, and even more interesting, a couple that might be popular and on a lot of people's lists that you don't like. And you're like, you know what? Everybody wants this one. I'm not interested. Um, are there any that fall into either of those two categories that you can talk about? And I understand you're there, you're buying horses. You know, you may not want to want, want, want to talk about everything. So that that's understood. But anyway. No, a- absolutely. I think... Um... And I'm just trying to refamiliarize myself with my book. Um, I will be 100% honest and say that several of those million dollar horses from last night were not, they didn't make our cut. Um, for whatever reason, we didn't feel they were. There, there were that. four. There were four that went over for a yeah. Right? yeah. And so, none, of them, none of them were ones that you really wanted. There was one Uncle Mo that I thought was a very nice horse. I still thought a million was a bit steep for him. Um, but of the four, there were three that I didn't think were worth making the final list. Um, as athletes, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe one of them goes out and wins five grade ones and makes me look like a moron, but I didn't think that they were good enough initially. Um, and then looking forward to tonight, I think there's a couple of sleepers. There's a very interesting horse over at, uh, Gainesway and he's a son of a stallion that I honestly, had to look at, at July and I, I turned to Dominic and said, who the heck is this flame away? Who's flame away? I've never oh, heard. I remember, I remember flame away. So there's a horse at Gainesway who's by flame away. I think he's hip 169. Um, yeah, he's hip 169. Um, I think he's a, a solid athlete. He's, he's on the cusp of my list one, list two, but I think he's a very good individual. I think by, by the sire, he's going to fall through the cracks and actually be an affordable purchase. Um, I think he's overshadowed by some very big stallions in this sale. Um, so I like him a lot. Obviously, the half brother to Matoli is, is going to be, um, you know, it'll be like a knife fight on the subway. It'll be bloody to whomever gets that horse. He's going to be, he's a very nice horse by the hottest stallion on the planet at the moment. It will be very interesting who walks away with him and for how much. Um, but obviously, I'm to this- what that horse, what that horse goes for. I, yeah, I really, yeah, yeah. And who so- wind up getting him and who they wind up sending him, sending him, sending him to. Uh, let's go to you at the sale talking about the war front, um, Colt, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about what we might see see uh, on the second night. To me, this Colt's one of the best Colts in the sale. He's by Warfront out of Seek and Destroy. He's a grade three winner. Um, what I particularly like about this Colt is he's got a great, strong shoulder, a very strong hip. And when you watch him walk for a horse that has this weight, he's actually got a phenomenal athletic movement to him. So we're going to have him walk and uh, kind of show you how all this physical works together with the horse himself. So typically for a yearling of this size, with this type of weight and muscle and bone, you don't see a horse that's this light on his feet and this athletic. As you watch him go by, he uses every piece of himself really efficiently. He stretches for ground with his front feet. He really pushes off with his hind feet. When you watch him turn, which is a big piece, he's actually very light on his feet as he turns. There's no sloppy movement there. He knows how to use himself. So there's a lot of athleticism with this horse. He's by Warfront, who's a very good sire, who's a very consistent sire. Obviously, the sire of Omaha Beach and a lot of other great horses. So this is not a horse that's going to be inexpensive, but personally, for me, I think he's one of the best horses in the sale. Warfront throws a lot of grass horses. This horse looks like he might be able to go either way. I still think he's one of the top horses in the sale. I mean, he's a very, very nice horse, kind of with a horse. When you see a horse that heavy as a yearling, sometimes you worry when they're going to walk. They're just going to kind of be a plotter. They're not going to have a whole lot of athleticism. They're not going to be very light on their feet. When they are that light on their feet and extremely efficient, it kind of makes you think of like a Zion Williams, right? Big, heavy, but just extremely athletic and light. Those tend to be better horses as they mature and go onwards. Some of that weight he'll lose as he matures, 
and as he gets older and leans out once he starts race training, but it's a phenomenal physical of a horse. You can't really fault him for much. Colt here by Warfront by the Sire of three champions, great one winning Colts such as Lines of Battle, War of Will, Omaha Beach, and Air Force Blue. you want back in back there? 500, 475,000 upstairs tray. Well, you know, I, I, I think that was interesting. Um, you know, explain what you like ab uh, 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 about that cult, a, a little bit about your and, and Forza's selection process and, and, and what you do. Uh, what can we expect to see tonight? I mean, I guess, I guess we kind of covered it. Just a, a little bit more adrenaline, a little bit more excitement. Uh, the sale topper. What night do we see the sale top? Opening night, second night, later on down the line, do we know? Yeah, I think tonight, as we discussed, Matoli's half-brother, I think, tops the sale. I don't see why he wouldn't. Um, as I said, I think some of the million-dollar horses last night were good horses. They didn't make our final cut, except one of them. Um, this horse is firmly on the list as one of the nicer colts in the sale. Um, his, he's... he's he deserves, unless there's something massively wrong on, on x-rays. And so this is something that people might not understand because we get this question a lot. Why did that exceptional horse not sell well, right? So as we start going through our selection process, we find the horses, we like the horses, we then bet the horses. So you could look at a horse and say he scopes perfect and he scopes perfect. You could look at the horse and say the radiographs are good and they're good. Then you could go and you could scan a suspensory because um, we tend to do, we like to be as thorough as we can when people are investing their money with us. So we don't go forward and buy a horse without making sure that we've kicked every single tire. So we've looked at the horse's airway. We've looked at his radiographs. We've asked about his disposition, how he was at the farm, what he's like in the stall. Does he crib? Is he, you know, what is he like behaviorally? And then we'll take it one step further and we'll scan ultrasound every soft tissue structure on the lower leg to make sure that there might not be a tear in something that is going to be significant to this horse down the road. So sometimes you'll see these big horses go through the ring and people say, well, he was out of a grade one winner and by justifying his $50,000. It's usually because something pops up on veterinary findings that knocks that horse's price tag down. So Unless this some, son, some of those wind up runners too, though, right? They run through that. Oh, for sure. And, uh, and there's certain things that heal. So that's the interesting thing when you get into the process of RNAs. And we bought a nice filly last year out of this sale uh, by Good Magic to help somebody purchase her um, who RNA'd. And she's turned out to be a, a good filly in Europe. So some of it is a timeline thing of understanding what you can accept on veterinary findings, what's going to heal, what's not going to hinder the horse. And, and being able to get a discount because you're willing to take a dented can off the supermarket shelf when the soup inside is just the same as the nice can, you know? Now, um, we'll, we'll, we'll close with a couple of, uh, lack of a better term, caveat and tour questions, okay? Okay. Uh, let's say I'm the owner of this half to Matola, okay? Yeah. Uh, and he's showing all the right signs, okay? Yeah. He's, he, I, I think he's going to be a phenomenal racehorse. Why, yeah. why am I putting him in the sale? Why don't I keep him and race him myself? Depends on, so sometimes, and it's an interesting thought process because I was exposed to it early by a friend of mine who ran a big breeding operation and trained for them. So every couple of years, what they'd do is they'd pick out some of their better horses. They'd still keep a lot of them, but they'd take a good horse and sell it because that can then finance all the stud fees for the previous years, and it can finance the stud fees for the next book of mares. So if you sell one of the right horses, 
it can finance everything for you. So he could potentially be one of the most exceptional yearlings in this sale. That owner could have five more that are just as good, if not better, and says, you know what? We'll sell that one because his pedigree is so big, he'll pay for the rest of this lot, and I'd rather keep these ones. And here's the other piece. Some people put these horses into the sale, and as I mentioned in one of the videos, they'll come back in as the breeder and say, I want to stay in for 25% now that you bought my horse. And they'll buy back 25% to stay involved. But the person who bought it could always say no. They like, could, I, but I, I, sometimes I those, a lot of it is they know the consigners are really good at their jobs. They know how many times I've looked at their horse. They know everybody else who's looked at their horse. They know exactly who's probably on their horse, right? So with that being said, that information will get passed back on to the owner. The owner then sets the reserve as they have a talk with the team. And the owner might say, hey, you know what? I see that uh, Eclipse Thoroughbreds is on my horse. I like Eclipse. I'm going to call them and say, if you buy my horse, I'll partner back in on it. Okay? And that's, that's not unethical. That's, that's totally. No, they're just like, if you end up buying my horse, I, I, I'm happy to join you. If it's somebody right. else they know and they might not like. Because of the is same that thing. Not, is that not a little bit of an advantage to Eclipse if nobody else has that deal on the table? Because I know, hey, if I go for $2 million for this horse, the guy who owns them is going to buy in for 25%. That's half, that's half a million. It's only really costing me one point five, and I've got control of the horse. Yeah, that's I mean, it's it, it, an it, advantage it, over the guy next to me who's got to put up the whole $2 million. It could be, but oh, you, yeah. see it, you see it a lot pre-sale, right? So there was last year... Uh, when we were at this sale, we talked to people, hey, look, we like this horse. We've heard you're on this horse. Do you want to partner? And right. that's how you're seeing some of these bigger partnerships come together, right? You, you, you've heard who's looked at the horse. You know who's potentially on the horse. You know the individuals. You say, you know what? They're probably going to get along with our client, and it could be a good marriage for everybody. Let's work together pool funds and buy this horse and then maybe we have more funding to go buy more horses together so it's it is an advantage but that's why this business is built on relationships and trust so if you got good relationships you got more opportunities if you have no relationships yeah you're at a disadvantage you're gonna have to outspend somebody else i think i said i i, I don't like to take credit but i think i said it best myself once when someone said to me trust me i said there's only two people in the world i trust One's me, the other one's not you. So yeah. <laughs> trust nobody. But gotcha. uh, um, caveat emptor, I think, applies to, to, to well, just about everything, but the, the sales as, as much as, as, as anything. Uh, fast, fascinating window and glimpse into one of the most fascinating sales, not only horse sales, but just in general sales in the world. If you haven't seen it, I think you'll love the footage that we showed you tonight. Uh, if you watch a horse go through the ring and, and, and watch that process, it's it's a fascinating thing. We've talked before about the spotters and how amazing they are at catching any little type of bid. Uh, one fun thing, do certain people who bid, I guess you get to know them after a while, do they have certain things that they do? Like, you know how people will gamble, they root a certain way, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, so I, I heard a really funny story um, the other day, and uh, there was an individual who had told a bid spotter that he was going to, if he had a pen in his shirt pocket, he was still in on the horse, okay? And to take his bid, as long as the pen was in his shirt pocket. Okay. So he's sitting there, pens in the shirt pocket, you know, person's rebuttaling, somebody bids, pen still in the shirt pocket. Somebody came up and asked for the autograph of okay. this individual. He took the pen out of the pocket. So the bid spot is like, what's going on? Is he out? So he signs the autograph and gives the pen to the kid who asked for his autograph. Kid runs off with the pen and the bid spotter is thinking, what is going on here? Right? This is, is he in? Is he out? Like, we don't know. The pen's not in the pocket anymore. What's going on? So then bidding escalates. Bidding escalates. Somebody else jumps in. So the bidding has gone through the roof. Kid runs back and says, hey, sir, I think you forgot your pen. He says, oh, thanks. Puts it back in his pocket. Next thing you know, bidding closes and they come with the check and said, hey, you got a sign for the horse you just buy. He says, I didn't buy the horse. He said, the pen's in your pocket. You said, if the pen was in your pocket, you were bidding. 
he forgot he put the pen back in his pocket. So he had to sign. I think it was for a million dollar horse too. So he had to sign a big check, but. Uh, he's back in, man. Expensive lesson. You, he's, you, he's back you in. The rules. Yeah. You got to play, you got to honor your own rules. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. You're setting, setting the rules. Um, so I guess some of the, do, do some of these people have tells like, 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 like in poker, you, you, you know, you're sitting in the room yeah. and you know, okay, I could tell that, uh, yeah. This guy is interested in this horse just by the way he's carrying himself when they bring that horse into the sale. I oh, mean, absolutely. I, had one. I never knew I had one, but a very close friend of mine said, John, I could always tell when you're alive for a lot of money because you've got that poker face and you don't let on. You could lose a photo for, for a hundred thousand, and the guy next to you doesn't know it. He goes, But I know. I'm like, How do you know? He goes, Because when it's big money to you, you always lean. He goes, You always tilt your body a little bit. Like I do, I never knew it. I, you know, you don't realize it. He goes, I always know when you're alive. Even if I ask you, when you say, nah, you know, I know when you're lying because when they're coming down the lane, if you're leaning, I know it means something to you. So do some of those people have? Yes, that yes, they, yeah. they, a lot of them do. Everybody does subconsciously. Uh, we had a client it. last year that I knew as soon as he started stroking his beard like this, <laughs> I said, oh, we're out. He's done. I love he it. said he was good to this point, and the next thing you know, he's in his. I said, "Well, we're off this horse now. We're, it's on to the next one." So yeah, everybody. Some, got some, a some people watching will get this, like KGB with the Oreo cookies and in, 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 in rounders. Um, yeah, just tell at the poker table. So uh, great show, love it. Good luck tonight. Appreciate uh, it. Book two. Uh, we have so much more coming for Saratoga and and, and more and. We won't even talk about the Breeders' Cup now, but this was great. I think people will love it. Thanks you, everybody, for tuning in to Unfiltered on Past the Wire TV. This was truly unfiltered, and we hope you all enjoyed it. Ciao. Back, coming down to the city. If a picture is worth a thousand words, this is one stunning picture. Honorary B is pull up now, second on the upside. Second on the upside. DRF Formulator, the gold standard in past performance information, is now free exclusively on DRF Bets. Join DRF Bets with the promo code WINNING, get a $250 first deposit match bonus, a $10 free bet, and free formulator already uploaded to your account. Access Formulator's premium features, including sortable trainer stats, race replays, personalized trip notes, and lots more. Free formulator exclusively on DRF Bets. Nobody does it better.